This is Known Podcast, hosted by Dustin Bennett, the lead pastor of Known Victory Church in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Known Podcast is dedicated to helping you grow closer to Jesus, unleashing the power of your creativity, and developing you as a leader. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Well, welcome back to the Known Podcast. We're so excited that you're joining us today. And today we're so excited because we actually have our first ever guest, which is my very own brother, Scott Bennett. And so we're excited to just talk about creativity, talk about creative process, talk about things like that. And so, Scott, why don't you just introduce yourself a little bit, share a little bit about who you are and what you do. I can do that. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott, Dustin's older brother. Um, whenever we're you know, in, a, in the same building together. Some people are like, you guys are obviously brothers. So yeah. that's, that's kind of, <laughs> we've lived in each other's shadows more or less over the years. Uh, Dustin, I played in a, in a rock band for a long time. Yeah. Um, I still play in that band. I record bands. I, you didn't even say the name of the band. Uh, the band's called the pathless. That's Travel. Right. You can, you can, check. I'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll post maybe some photos of us playing Dustin on our had story. Long hair, yeah. down here. It was great. long hair. It was, it was high energy. It was fun. So maybe I'll, I'll post some photos of that maybe this week, but you were living in Edmonton and sometimes he would drive down like three hours to play a show and then have to go. You were working with one of best brothers. I think. Yeah. I was working with, yeah, I was working construction. I'm not a construction guy at all. And then, yeah, I would literally <laughs> leave like Friday after work come, we'd play like a Friday show and then we'd play Saturday night and then I'd drive back like late either Saturday. Yeah. And then one, one time I got in a car accident, yeah. <laughs> I was on my way home, it was like two in the morning and I just swipe in this car and I'm saying, Calgary, is this whole, this terrible. whole thing? I feel bad. So but funny it was, It's funny. The also, Dustin loved Aaron Gillespie and Under Oath and he found this contest at, where they're like, you could open for the almost. And I'm like, all right. So yeah. he sends it to me yeah, and then I'm like, okay. And then I submit it and then we do our thing and we actually win. I'm like, okay, Dustin, we won. And he's like, I don't want to ask best brother time off. I can't, I don't want to ask him for time go. off. I don't know him. So I can't play this show. So it was his favorite band. We're opening for like one of his favorite musicians of all yeah. time. And then he didn't come. It was fun. Yeah. And Spokane. Spokane. And you guys, we rented you as like, we rented like an RV and like yeah. drove down, had a fill in bass player. Like yeah, I think we was... spent $2,000 to <laughs> go play for free for a weekend between right. like the, the, the band members who could make it. And then didn't, funny. <laughs> didn't like Aaron Gillespie say we've had guys like that don't even play they lied they lied about where they were from <laughs> yeah. we were they were from like central and we're in western and then I'm like oh we're from Canada he's like you're from Canada it was great. cross border <laughs> cross country that was so funny that was a good time so funny but anyway so you record bands you play in a band I book concerts and yep. stuff yeah They're very like my, my life is music industry for sure yeah Little pieces of everything. Okay, so then let's just start music because music's obviously been a part of your story for so long. Mm -hmm. um, how did that start for you when it came to music? Um, well, our dad was hit by a car. Yep. Uh, in 2003 or 2001? 2003, I think. Oh, was it right after September 11th? I can't remember. It was, it was like early. Early, early 2000s. Yeah, early 2000s. In my mind, it's 2004, but. Maybe it was. Uh, and then uh, I wanted to, I just like, I don't know. I'm not really good. My memory's not great at like, this is when this yeah, happened. Yeah. It's all kind of blurred, but something along the lines of, I was like, dad was home and I was like, Hey dad, like for Christmas, I just, I want a guitar. I want to learn how to play guitar. Right. And at the time I was, like, I want to be a worship leader. So that's, yeah. I think that was, I don't know how true that was, but I knew if I said that, dad would yeah, be yeah, a yeah. guitar. It's like, so, it's like, I want to lead worship. It's like, okay, here's yeah, a guitar. Like, here's a guitar, whatever you want. <laughs> so, the, what is it? F Epiphone SG, right? Was that well, the first guitar? No, I got a teleacoustic, which is yes. a Telecaster acoustic with this. That's it right. sounded awful. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I had a teacher in, in uh, junior high who was a great influence for me and really there for me when dad had his accident and stuff. And that's what he played. And just because he was my hero, that's what I wanted to play. Going back, yeah. it's like a terrible guitar, but like yeah. I'm so thankful for that, that yeah. teacher. And when you, you, you learn on the, the instrument, right? Oh, that thing, like, it became a joke how much I played. Like, every, like, I wasn't the most social one. I had some friends, but our parents wouldn't let us play like modern video games. No. So we had nothing in common with our well, friends. We had what, a Nintendo 64 until for, like 2010? Yeah. Like, I got like my that. first Xbox in like 2011 or yeah. something. So, so like, funny. friends would come over and we'd still be playing Super Smash Brothers and Mario yeah. Party 1. Oh, yeah. But uh, I would like just play the guitar at lunch and recess and stuff. And then I would let other people play it. I taught a bunch of my friends how to play yeah, guitar so on cool. the guitar. It was in terrible shape by the time I heard yeah. of it. But um i don't know that that guitar got me into it and then i went to see like obviously i'd seen like thousand of a crotch and starfield yeah. and jake and newsboys and like i've always loved live music but right i saw dad took me to see guns and roses yeah. in, on december 6 2006 i think was the I, don't, I think that date's important to me i guess i remember that one but right guns and roses yeah. um that was my first like arena concert ever and i was like wow like this is this is cool this is like 
I don't know. I, I've always felt this connection or being at home in sort of a live music setting. I love it. So right. that was it. I got excited and, and you know, just taught myself how to play guitar. The, YouTube wasn't even a thing then. So I just had like oh, yeah. Google tabs and stuff. And yeah, what's, songs. what's that? Uh, Ultimate guitar. Ultimate guitar. Yeah, yeah, of course. So that's what I used. And uh, I don't know. I just kept playing and uh i had a friend that i met at a concert in edmonton who's from saskatoon we're really good friends to this day so cool and uh he was like yeah i'm in a band and we opened for silverstein and i was like you can be in a, a band and open for silverstein like that's yeah. possible and he's like yeah and i was like man like i want that so then i just kind of worked out some friends were available and then we we started the band in like late 2012 and then yeah I'll, I'll, i don't think I'll, i don't think i'll ever forget the day when we were uh you were like, hey, uh, you want to play bass in this band? I was like, I barely play, but yeah, yeah, dude, I'd love to. And then I think that night, like, I don't think I'm joking. I think that night or later that week, we went to Millennium Park and did our Six first photos. ever photo shoot. Um, and we got, we got, I think we still have those photos. Maybe I'll see if I can they're, pull they're, some they're of those up. They're on pure volume. <laughs> and Dustin dude. bought this amb- amazing flying V bass that just like was so hilariously metal that like some people, I don't know. Maybe yeah. if you're into flying V basses, like. I love Good that for you. about you, but it just wasn't wasn't the image from our band. It I wasn't think. us. <coughs> yeah, it's so There's a video on YouTube about it where Dustin and I are like, you know, 90 pounds each, and we're like, yeah, it. 90 pounds ago. Yeah, yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know that. I guess I don't know. Music's always just been a connection with me. Obviously, I, I played in like worship teams and stuff yeah. growing up, and uh, played in a youth group and stuff. So I'm really like. I'm really thankful for my upbringing where, you know, our parents were supportive. They yeah. were able to like dad, espe- like, like mom and dad both, but the dad, especially if I had an interest or a love, he would like do his absolute best to make sure I had the tools necessary to sort of oh, pursue yeah. that interest. And like, I'm so thankful that that was a, a, a trait. Dad, well, had. we had, we had parents who supported our, our, our like hobbies or like our the things that we felt we were called to like i mean yeah. for me like i was playing football and that was like a big part of my story yeah and, and, dad, and dad would go to all the games and yeah. got books and to understand how the game was played and mom would watch all of them and we'd be, yeah. we'd be freezing we'd be watching you and minus 40. saskatchewan or whatever yeah, yeah. it's cold it's like lloyd minster <laughs> minus 40 and we lost it's like, yeah, it's like it was what was the point it was a great trip but yeah our parents were very very right. supportive in that way and like although i may not be you know actively involved in church anymore uh, i'm thankful for the upbringing that i yeah. had Totally. That, um, yeah, that that build the build the blocks for me to be able to play music, and it's very much an outlet for me, an emotional outlet. Right. And, yeah. So what, like you obviously you've played many shows like over the uh, over the years, you know, and some small ones, mm-hmm. and some, some decently big ones. And so like I guess maybe share a moment. Like, what's your favorite live music that you were a part of that you played or you attended that really just like. It's just like this really like the and coolest moment, you know, when it comes to music. Then. So the first one was, uh, our, there's a band called I Prevail. They made a Taylor Swift cover that honestly wasn't very good. I saw it and was like, I don't think this is going to get very big. Yeah. And it blew up in ways yeah, that exploded. don't even make sense. And this band became huge. And they, at the beginning of this cover release, they announced this tour or whatever, something along these lines. And then as that tour, like as they're exploding we got to open for them like right on the cusp of them just like taking off to, so we played an 800 cap venue that was sold out. Yeah. So cool. And that was like, I don't know. That was the most fun I've ever had on stage, I think. Cause like you just go out and put your hands up in the crowd, thinks you're on the tour package and loses their mind. And they had so much fun and we had so much fun. That was like, that's my favorite show I've ever played. Yeah. And it means a lot to me that I had that opportunity. I'm very thankful for it. I was there. Yeah. I didn't, I wasn't playing that at that point. I think you had just fired me at that point. We just switched (laughs) bass players and then, and then, uh, yeah, we got the biggest show of our lives. Yeah. So sorry about but that. But we got to open for POD. Yeah, we did we open for POD. For POD was cool, too, because I grew up no. Silverstein, yeah. P- uh, Finger 11 Finger is the other 11. band we opened for, yeah. It, yeah. Everyone watching this doesn't know who those bands it's, are anymore, though. Yeah, they're old now. It's like, <laughs> it's like I don't even know. Justin but Bieber? It was yeah. cool. It was yeah. cool at the time. And then attended uh, one of the top weekends of my life. I went out to Quebec with my drummer, Jordan, my yeah. guitarist, Mike, and we camped out at this festival that was like every band we'd ever liked at any point in our lives playing on one weekend. And like, I can't even touch how amazing that weekend was. So oh, good. man, it's so cool. Very, very cool. So with, let's go to maybe shift to talking about creativity. Like, obviously, you know, you're, you're never going to get to those moments, especially, you know, you're opening for this big band. You know, it's going to take a process to get there. Like, obviously, when we first started, mm-hmm. you know, the Path Less Traveled, whatever, like 10 years ago now. You know, we were playing in front of like, you know, four people. Mm-hmm. And so like when it t- comes to creativity, like the question is like, 
how did you, first of all, I guess, realize that you had something inside of you, like this message that you had that you wanted to share? And how did you figure out how to actually present that message um, to, to the people, the audience, however you want to call it? I don't know if there's ever a specific message as much as, as much as it's just like, I want to do this. I don't know. Like, I know some people have a process or a deeper like reason behind something, but it's just like, I feel drawn to this. I really enjoy this. I really want to do this. Right. And, uh, when you have ADHD, like I do, yeah. both hyper, of us, you nice, hyper focus on things that you like. <laughs> yeah. And music was that, uh, like, I don't know. I couldn't do my homework. I couldn't focus on things, but like when I could sit with a guitar, I could like, you know, play for hours. So, um, it was always just like, I don't know if I chose it. I think I just was driven to it and yeah. like, it's just like became a part of me. So more like a natural process where yeah. you, I mean, I'm sure you were like writing riffs on your guitar, you know, writing like ly- like melodies and lyrics before you even realized what you were doing. Uh, sort of. Yeah. Like the writing process, like I think I started writing songs a little bit late. Okay. Um, like later than most people, like not that it's that late, but I was like 18 or 19 or something. Right. Whereas like a lot of people start in their 12, 14. So yeah. by the time you do it and you're in your early twenties, you're already, already pretty good. So I think my progression was like a little bit later because there is sort of this 10 year process to become really good at something. Yeah. Um, the second part of your question was how did I move forward with that? Yeah. Um, for me, I, uh, it's about finding your, what you're good at and then leaning in on that because there's right. so many things that I'm bad at yeah. that, and if I, I try and spend effort to be better at it, I'll probably end up disappointing myself and also just not be very good at it. Mm. So for me, it was like, okay, like as an example, if I don't write a song quickly or like st- ride the wave of excitement, yeah. it'll like go into like a hard drive full of half finished songs that I have. Like I have so many. Right. <laughs> so the key is to be like, I'm aware that if I don't finish this relatively soon, I will lose interest in this or I'll forget about it because I'm sort of a forgetful person too. So yep. I will forget about this. Right. So I need to ride the wave of energy and get as much done as I can as possible. And then if it needs more than that, I need some sort of accountability in place that drives right. me to help finish that. Because I think maybe it's ADHD, I don't know, but I think for me I'm the same way where it's like I start something and then as soon as I lose like, lose, like the motivation or the a- a- excitement about it, it's like I'm going to move on to like the next thing where it's like this yep. excites me now because this is old. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of like half-finished projects that it's like I started this, but so oh, well, like I want to start something brand new. And so like I heard this this quote sometime. I forget who was saying it. He's talking about writer's block. Mm-hmm. And writer's block, I mean, I talk about like writing books or whatever. But even in music or art, I think there's this block that comes where sometimes you're like I don't have anything. And his, his suggestion was just like then write poorly. He's like, just that's the best way to do it. It's not just quit. It's just, just the right bad, bad. Yeah. right? And then rather than, bad, totally. yeah, exactly. But stop, just don't just stop. It'll keep writing. Mm-hmm. And eventually you're going to have that breakthrough where even sometimes your bad writing might actually become really good because mm-hmm. you're writing out of a place of needing it too. So it was just very unique. I think one of the most important things in life that like, this is like a weakness for me is consistency because yeah. the, like the tortoise and the hare story is all about like going at a pace that you can maintain right. consistently is going to get you farther than sprints ever will. Yep, absolutely. And like, I don't know. I just, I, it's a lesson that I continually learn and I'm like, I'm aware of in myself. Right. And it, it's frustrating sometimes. Like, if it's like a, if it's something you know you struggle with, but you still let yourself down, it's kind of frustrating to be in that yep. place. But being aware of your limitations and then trying to use them to an advantage is the best thing you can do in that situation, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's, I think that that's really key. And I guess going to that too, when it comes to, you know, even holding yourself accountable. I think part of that is like how you define success as well, Mm -hmm. because I think especially if you're, you're say you're an artist or you're creative and you're creating content that's going out to no, not massive numbers of people. You're not meeting, you know, millions and millions of people. I think there can be some frustration that comes, but I think it's because you haven't defined what you view as success. And so like for you, how do you define success when say you release a piece or you release a, uh, a song or whatever it is, how do you define, okay, this was successful. I think, success is a is a spectrum and i think it's unique to the individual so i think like we could look at like you know taylor swift or something and say okay that's success yeah. and that's probably like the ceiling of music success of of the modern well, world she'd be the biggest artist i think I in think the world so. her and probably justin bieber would be kind of up there, there. Yeah. like like sure that's success but is it practical for every single person to do that no, no. i think it's okay to dream big i think but i also right. think it's important to be Self-aware. Self-awareness is really important. So, like, I would love to be in a touring band and, like, play big shows and stuff. But, like, I have a wife and two kids and I need to, you know, be around for that. So totally, when you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else and vice versa. So it's like 
even if I had the X factor that could take me there, like let's hypothetically say I have that, but I also have my family, you need, you do need to make a choice of like what actually would be success. And it's like, there's a lot of people who go all in on their life's ambition, but then they sort of fall short and right. they don't have, you know, the, the family group or whatever. And like, for me, I've always felt like I love music and it's a part of me, but I need my family and my, my social networks more. That means more to me. So I right. made that choice to be like, Okay, like regardless of whether or not it would have been successful in like a full yeah. touring band or whatever, I made the choice to be like, I want to be around for my family and friends because right. that's truly what I love in life more than anything else right. is, is close, intimate time with those people and, you know, deep conversations where you talk. Like those are things that I really, really value. Right. So to me, if you can achieve a balance that allows you to have these outlets that are creative that you enjoy, which I, I, I do, right. and you also have a sort of healthy work-life balance or a healthy like relationship with the, the people that mean a lot to you that is a version of success and that is like sort of what i sort of aspire to and like i don't get that right every day no, uh, or not all the time and it's not always perfect and it's it's growing right and that's why i would say it's a spectrum because the goalpost sort of moves depending yep. on what you're focusing on and i yep. think if you're looking at like taylor swift and you're like i'm not that i suck or like you're frustrated with that then like you're you're, you're beating yourself up almost unnecessarily totally and artists also this is a unique thing that uh, I don't think I don't think non-creatives understand. I have a friend who posts on socials a lot about his art and how it's not landing with people, and it's not uh, like it's not really resonating. And he is probably one of the most talented people I've ever met. He is phenomenally good at what he does. Right. He's meticulous. He's consistent. He can do things over the long haul, and he does truly impressive things. And he has this sort of, sometimes he has this, this crass, not crass attitude, but like a, a burnt out, like hurt attitude. Like my stuff's not resonating with people. And then the artists tend to like vent that on social media because Facebook used to be this tool where people could see your stuff and now it's not so much. Well, algorithms and everything, right? It's, <laughs> it's all changing for so different and, yeah. and ads and whatever. So different. And like when people who aren't creative see these statuses that are like sort of, maybe it's griping or whatever the case, like I don't think there's an understanding there of why that person feels the way they do. And I think a creative person, when you create something that you really, really believe in, it feels like an extension of you or a piece of you. Yep. And when people reject that art, it feels like you're being rejected. Yeah, you feel rejected because you're what you've created, which is like you said, yeah. part of you. It's like your DNA, your heart and soul has gone into it. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, this sucks. <laughs> like you can spend like 100 hours on a song, let's say, and you get it perfect for you and then you put it out and it has like 27 streams or something like that can really hurt you. So when that happens, I think, and not that this is easy and everyone has those moments right. or creative, but like you need to realize, I think, or what's helped me is like, I made this song for myself. Yes. That's so key. And I, I, or I made this painting or whatever, whatever the yeah. creative endeavor is you're doing. I did this for myself. I love how this is. If other people resonate with it, awesome. But if they don't, then it's fine. And I, like, I don't know. There's this like, Christian book a long time ago called uh, You Are Special by Max Lucado mm -hmm. and this puppet like it's like a puppet world and they give each other gold stars or black yep. dots or whatever that, yeah. and like I don't know <laughs> this is, I, my perspective on this book's always been a little bit different is like accept the gratitude but just deny the like you don't have to just not care what people think at all just like when people like what you do they're like sick and then if someone doesn't like what you're doing or it doesn't resonate don't don't carry that just be like oh whatever right. So accept the gold stars, but don't accept right. the black dots. Right. That's that's how I would write that book. But <laughs> <laughs> you so should. <laughs> it's a missed opportunity for Max. Yeah, Lucado. I guess. Hey. No, I'm sure there's a reason why he wrote it that way. But like my whole life right. since I read that book, it's like it's okay to accept praise from people. I think because it, it feels good and like it edifies your art and makes you feel like what I put out was. I worth think something. it can motivate you too, right? When you're creating something, like obviously, I think when you create, you should be proud of it yourself. Mm -hmm. Like I think create something that that you, that you're that you're proud of. Mm -hmm. If you're creating to just gain the, the either like the the respect or you're trying to gain the gratitude or the grain like the compliments, mm -hmm. you're creating it for that. You're gonna be let down because mm -hmm. there's gonna be people who hate it. There's gonna be people who think it's horrible. Mm -hmm. And it's like learning that like you know if you're building creating it for yourself, that's really cool. But just making sure that yeah, like it can motivate you when people are you know encouraging you or saying hey like this I love this piece of art. It's really encouraging. I think it can motivate you to keep going. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes if you're just creating. And you're hoping your dream is like, I want this to reach like a thousand people and it reaches five. You're like, this is horrible. Why did I even do this? How much energy did I waste? But it's like, did you enjoy the process? Did you enjoy totally. creating? The process is the most important. Yeah. And also like, there's something that I don't think enough people talk about 
is let's say you have a piece of content that truly goes viral and truly like transcends. All of a sudden, you're in a new position of a new stress of like, can I do this again? Yeah. If can I, I can't do this again, did I fail? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, like, am I a failure because I can't do this again? Or you, you set up this regular content stream and you're doing it, but then you're two years in and you're like, man, like this is literally, if I don't make a video tomorrow and I don't want to make a video tomorrow, I won't be able to make my, my ends meet for the end of the month for, for money or whatever. Like I have to be creative in order to survive. And like, that isn't necessarily a win. It is for a lot of people, but a lot of creatives actually that would stress them out and make them hate the art. Yeah, and you creating. see that a lot, to be honest, especially like you see like these bands have these one, you know, hit, what hit, one hit wonders or whatever. And then they try, try and recreate and they can't. And then people are like, give us do what you again. used to do. And it's like, we're trying. But if yeah. we create that again, you're also going to hate it. So it has to be new, but it also has to be fresh. Yeah. And it has to still be you. Like, there's a lot of that. And you see really that hard. with YouTubers, especially. Oh, yeah. I, I can't count how many YouTubers I've seen who make a video saying, I need to take a break. I can't do this anymore. This is too much. Like mentally, I'm at a low spot because as soon as you like, you'll be yourself. And as soon as you turn on the camera, you're like, hi guys, how's it going? It's yeah. what I was. And then it's over. Like, okay, whatever. And then people see this like hyped up sort of pseudo fake version of you. And I think the, the people who are able to maintain that the, the best are the people who are not putting on some sort of show. Totally. They're just being themselves and the, enjoying the process of documenting their lives right. and, or whatever the art form is. But it's if you're doing it and you have to alter things about yourself, I think that comes from a place that's not genuine and therefore it's not sustainable to keep doing that for an indefinite amount of time. Right. So you would say like in creativity, you obviously have to be yourself. It's crucial. So I think so many times when in create like creativity, just in human nature, I think we try and we see things we enjoy and we try and like, you know, mirror that. So mm -hmm. it's like, I like this form of art. And so I'm going to try and copy it. And it's like, well, you're not going to be able to do it to the same ex extent as them. Like if the, the Beatles didn't exist, like there's that movie, I forget what it's called. Uh, yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. Movie. And it's like, it's unique because I think about it, if the Beatles were to come today, you know, would their music resonate with people? To be honest, it probably wouldn't in the same way that Maybe it not. did, you know, 30 years ago, but just because of the way that the world has changed. And so we can't recreate what somebody else has created. No, it's also kind of like, I don't know if you remember, but like when you're in junior high and your friend starts dating somebody and then... <laughs> All of a sudden, everything they're wearing is different, and they're yeah. listening to all this different music and stuff. And like, it's okay to try new things. It's important, but like, you know, the reason they're doing this is just to impress yeah. somebody. They're wearing that real tight, like girl pants yeah. and or like, what, whatever's yeah, yeah. popular now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's probably as bad now. As I possible. don't know what's what's the hard difference, to say. But. but then, like, you see your friend sort of loses their identity to this relationship, and then it's not sustainable because it's not who they are. And eventually, they just like three to six months later, that relationship doesn't work out because they were being someone they're not totally. for a relationship. Integrity and being honest with yourself is super, super important. Well, and like you talked about earlier, like I think unknowing yourself, like, you know, like you know who you are is really key because then you go into your art or creativity or relationship or work being like, this is what I can offer. At knowing your limitations, I think you talked about too because I think so many times we're like, the sky's the limit, which I, I truly believe that, you know, like you said, dream big, have big aspirations. But have those in an area where you are actually like, like you're like, strong. You and like, I can't just be like, okay, tomorrow we're both going to be in the CFL like tomorrow at 30 no. years old, right? It's not, no, that's not realistic. Like, no, but you could and I happen. couldn't also just like go buy a, a house and try and de reno it and sell it. Like, it's yeah, never going to no, happen. No. We couldn't do that at all. <laughs> It'd be, be worth less money than when exactly. We <laughs> it's like we'd, we, <laughs> we just have to burn it down for the, really for the insurance, insurance money. money. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. I'm totally. Yeah, so I think like when it comes to the creativity, I think there's so many things, but one of the biggest things that I think we face as humanity, whether it's creativity, whether it's at work, whether it's, you know, starting a business, whatever, the biggest things that that, that happen is obviously in any area, we're going to find criticism and we're going to find rejection. No matter where you go, you're never going to go to a place where you're fully, you know, everyone's just like, I love this art and you're going to find those people, um, but is it sustainable? So how how have you in your life dealt with the criticism and rejection? Um, maybe how have you responded poorly? And then how have you um, just been like, whatever, brush it off, be like, whatever, or it helped you grow to create something better? Just don't accept the black dot. <laughs> <laughs> no, like the, the, what, what's crucial is what, where that criticism is coming from. So mm -hmm. you're a pastor. Yeah. If somebody who is a plumber is like, hey, your sermon sucked on Sunday and the way you spoke was sucked. Say, okay, maybe like I didn't resonate with this person. But if Erin McManus was like, Dustin, 
your sermon sucked on Sunday. You'd be like, oof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you would, because he does it for a living, because that's his, his world, you would respect his opinion more than someone who doesn't really. Right. Know. There that's is good. something about being able to resonate with certain people. Like that is yep. important. If like, obviously your, your church community is going to be a bunch of people with different trades and jobs and you've got to like be able to speak to most of them. But the criticism on the art or whatever you're doing specifically it needs to come from a place where like criticism is a good thing and I agree. it is good to take yeah. it, but you need to make sure you're getting it. I w- like when I mix a song, this is probably a good example, but a little foreign. So mixing is when you take all the song, uh, all the individual tracks of vocals and drums and right. bass and guitar, and you mix it down into the stereo file that you would have on Apple music or Spotify. Right. And when I do that, before I send it to the band, I usually will send it to a couple trusted friends and I'll say, what do you guys, or what do you think of this? And the, someone will maybe like, Kate, the bass is too loud or this is, you know, this isn't working. This, you need to fix this. I trust that because they do it right. for a living and they're aware of it. And they're not, tr- and it's interesting because they're not, they're not um, judging the song on like the, the parts because it doesn't matter. They're judging the work that you put into it because yeah. the other band wrote the song, but you're actually coming in and mixing it and recording it. Yeah. And that's the difference too, I think. But yeah, it's they're like, it's like you, a mix. Like when you send a band a mix and they hate it like that, you, you take it personally. Totally. It sucks because you, you people are trusting you with their vision and it's your job to sort of like, like they gave you the rough idea and you're supposed to like take their painting and frame right. it and make it look really nice, you know? That's kind of mm. kind of what you're doing. And I like, it's, it's important that the criticism is coming from an educated source or someone that like, that makes sense. Right. So whenever I show my wife a song I mixed, she might say, oh, like, the number one thing she'll say is like, if I haven't finished like polishing the vocals, she'll say, is this mixed? Which like for, for Kathy, that phrase means like something sounds wrong with the vocals. This isn't like, this isn't how your normal stuff typically sounds. And usually that'll be when I'm writing a song and I haven't like done the final vocals and stuff. It's right. So it's just like the, the raw files. Yeah. But if I send it to someone who does it, they'll be like, Hey, like the vocals sound out of tune or Hey, this is way too loud. Or like, right. this, you should re-record this. Like, you'll get focused criticism, mm. and it's important to take that criticism once you receive it, and or like once you have it, and interpret it, and put it into your work to improve for the future. That's really totally. really important because criticism without action is is useless. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, criticism it should should I think in some ways push us to be better, mm-hmm. um, oh, or we realize should. that like what they're saying isn't even like true, right? And you're right. like, Whatever. well, like there's there's internet trolls or whatever you're <laughs> gonna be dealing <laughs> the with. The internet's they're, a they're crazy just, place. They'll just be mean, and yeah. like some people are just gonna be mean, and that's when you don't accept the black dots. However, if you, <laughs> I'm gonna, that's his podcast title should be known podcast. Don't accept the black dots. And people are like, what are they talking about? <laughs> They'll you know? come right in. <laughs> um, yeah. Like internet trolls are just some people like you'll have negative people in your life. Everyone has a family member who's just pessimistic and negative and they hurt people, hate hurt what people you do. and they'll just be mean to you or whatever. Well, especially like, cause for us, like for you, the music you, you write and you record and you play is pretty heavy. Like, it's not like it's like you're singing like some pop songs with three no. chords. Like, it's like, there's going to be bands that you like, you hear them singing, you're like, I don't even know what you're saying, well, right? It's, it's funny that like on a spectrum, it's not even that heavy, but yeah. The, yeah. The, when I was working in the oil sands, people were like, can I hear your band? I'd be like, you will hate it. I promise you, you will hate <laughs> yeah. it. So sure, like I'll show it to you, right. but it's not, yeah. Like, so I'm, I'm used to like being aware of like, okay, the genre of music I like is for me and like not right. everyone that I show is going to like Right, myself. because you're going to have people who look at the path less traveled like it's pretty, like it's heavy, you this know, heavier music. Core. They're like, this is horrible music. Like, this is like, satanic Yeah, it's like, this core. is the worst music I've ever heard. It's like, well, it's because you don't like this kind of music. So yeah. like t- something criticism from somebody just doesn't even enjoy like the art you're creating. It's like, yeah. well, you know, like it doesn't matter. It's when somebody, like you said, you know, they enjoy that type of music they listen to and they're like, hey, I don't like this. That's where you maybe take a more internal look and yeah like if, if it's something that they should be familiar with and are educated on and they have a problem with it i think it's something to look at and consider but if it's like a country fan who just hates a metal song then it's like okay like i right. get i get that this isn't for you and that's totally fine um but i don't need to sort of receive that to try and improve this totally yeah no that that's really that's really really good i guess another question is like what is the piece of work that you've created that you're the most proud of whether it's the band or a certain song or a project that you did for another band or whatever that you're like just this is i'm so proud of this that we did this or Um, i did this i wrote this song called heretic capulets which is just saying the word heretic was sort of improperly because it worked better phrasing um but basically the world's become extremely extremely divided and uh, absolutely polarized and partisan and 
that I'm very much like a hear both sides and, and meet in the middle or find the actual solution. It's not always it's not always fifty fifty. Sometimes it's ninety ten, something like that, right? right. There's a, there's situations where, but it's important to do the work, assess it, and don't just like give something a sprinkled topic of of like so a sprinkled solution of like okay, whatever. So I wrote this song that was about uh, like. I wrote it to sort of trick the listeners. So whoever listens to it, they're gonna be like, "Yeah, like it's it's sort of written in an unhealthy way, <laughs> where like you're right. listening to it and you identify with it from but, like, either from any spec, like any yeah, like any a, source, a really yeah. like right leaning person can listen to the song and be like, right. "Yeah, like this is about the left," or like a really left leaning person can be like, "Yeah, this is about the right," and it's like it's it's sort of a circumvented thing where like it's really just meant to sort of expose that and be right. like like this song is about like. I can sit down and be with you, even if politically I may not agree with you, because there's going to be something we can't talk about. And like, sure, there's extreme examples of like, right. like people that like you shouldn't probably associate with. I, I agree with that. But I think for the most part, because half the country isn't bad, right? Like half of Canada, half of the U.S. is not bad. Mm -hmm. um, there's different. There's 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 people here who make these choices for reasons, and like, yeah. we we just don't know. So that song really just dealt with that, and like that. I don't know what that song really means a lot to me, and uh, that's prob probably probably it. That's uh, really cool. Yeah. So ahead. that like when you like, how did you determine? So that's your you know most proud of that. But how did you determine the success for that? Like, was it the amount of views it got or the no. listens it got? <laughs> no. <laughs> right. In no one even knows that because like my band, our drummer was like not available for a long time. So my guitarist and I are like, hey, like let's just like make a project so we can release music. We put the song out on that. We didn't do a music video for it. It was a three-track EP. Like, no one listens to that song. Is but, that like, when you guys went to, like, Kananaskis or yeah, Canmore and, like, we're we in the shot, middle of the, like, snow, the yeah, drone yeah. and it stuff? Was fun. That was so cool. It was a cool video. Uh, that, was song, that song is called My Final Hour. I like that song a lot. So this song is on right after that on the EP. And, like, I don't even know what the play count is, but, like, I love that song. and it, It's probably my favorite song I've ever written. And, like... Is it on YouTube? Uh, the, the song file is, yeah. Like, Public? So I can actually see how many views it has. Are you okay if I yeah, if I right. share this publicly? It's gonna be like two or four, probably. Dude, what if what if it's like a million and it just like That'd exploded I mean, and you didn't even know? Million, I'd notice. You're cause... like, this is most successful, but you didn't even realize how successful it actually I mean, was. It won't be. <laughs> What's it called again? Uh, just we use the word heretic and then capulets and then just type in indefinite hiatus, I guess. So like the. I wrote this for me and I love it as a result. So that's why the success of this to me is like, I made this song and I love it. And 23 views. All right. Hey. 23 people. Thank you. Hey, for 24. And like some people <laughs> stream it on, uh, on like whatever. Like I see the numbers and it's not very high, especially cause that band doesn't get any promotion or anything. Right. It's not something you've invested a lot of your energy into. No, but like that song means the most to me. And there's another song that I also, well, means almost as much to me called The Ones That You Love The Most that isn't even released. Like, I don't even, I haven't even put it out. And I wrote it during one of my eight-hour songwriting challenges. And I love that song. I love the message of it. I love the vibe. And I just, like, haven't put it out because I haven't really had the, the correct outlet or, like, channel to release it because of the right. genre of the song. It's sort of like an Angels and Airwaves, like, yeah, upbeat like more thing. Like and uh, Yeah, so, like, I just haven't had, but, like, that song means a lot to me, too. I really mm -hmm. like, and, and whenever... You know, I need to remind myself of like what I'm capable of. I usually listen to that song or right. Heritage Capulets. That's so cool. I think, and that, I think that's really key. I think is going back to the things you're the pr most proud of. Because I think as artists, as creatives, I think you know, really said like create something you're proud of. But I think there's gonna be times where you create something like, dude, this is oh, I'm yeah. not proud I of hate this. this. Like, and that's I the one this. everyone likes. You I know. Yeah, and it's like, <laughs> it's like I went to see uh, I went to see John Mayer once, and he played one of his songs. I forget what song it was, and he plays it, and he's like. This song made me popular, but I hate it. <laughs> but I play it because you love it. <laughs> yeah. That is so funny. And I think it's just so key. But I think going back out of the the pieces you're the most proud of and realizing, okay, like I, I am capable, even if you are in this writer's block or this like motivation slump, you're like, I don't know if I would want to keep doing this is hard. Go back to the things you're the most proud of, and that's where you find your success. Mm -hmm. I think it's so cool. Um, last thing I want to kind of talk about, and I think this is the thing that I'm most proud of for you for. Besides just being my brother, like, I'm so proud of you. I'm so excited to, to have you in my life. Like, my brother's amazing, okay? He's, like, he's the best. I'm so grateful to have him in my life. You know, we've been through, obviously, as any siblings, we've been through a lot together, a lot of hard moments, a lot of cool moments, you know, moments when we were kids, and you were scared of me because I just get so angry, and you, like, pin me on the ground and, you know, those moments. But one of the things that, that during COVID— Last you, week. <laughs> yeah, this was actually this morning before we <laughs> came today. Um, but the thing that, that I think is really cool, during COVID— 
if you guys don't know what COVID was, COVID is this pandemic. <laughs> so I'm just joking. Um, but so COVID came and obviously we're all locked down. And you had just mentioned briefly eight hour, eight hour songwriting challenge, um, which I think is absolutely really like unbelievable that this started. So maybe share um, how that started, like what it is, obviously how it started. Um, because I think the main question is like art can gather people. Mm -hmm. And I think you really did this in such a beautiful way where you gathered bands together for the first time in a while. You gathered writers together for the first time and got them back together and writing together um, or even just on as individuals, even if it's over Zoom or whatever. And that really gathered people together and even streams and stuff. So anyway, um, eight hour songwriting challenge. What is it? And then share that you got nominated for an award for doing it. And you, I know you won't share that part. I wasn't going to share that part. No, but I, I'm going to ask you to, okay. because I'm really proud of you. Cause I think this is so, so, so cool. Thank so you. why don't you just share uh, the eight hour songwriting challenge? So, um, obviously like, there in the Calgary music community, there used to be like open mics and things you could go to to you know be in community uh, in the community of the the music scene, and uh, obviously that's taken away when bars and everything are closed down and churches are closed down. And uh, earlier I mentioned limitations being a strength. So for me, I usually if I'm gonna write a song, I need to sit down to do most of it in one sitting, or else, and I need to get excited enough about it on that one sitting to revisit it. Like it needs to be good enough that I'll be excited about it. So I would just try and do songs in four hours or eight hour spurts earlier and just I would set a day and go write a song and do my best with it. And so Indefinite Hiatus actually started sort of out of songwriting challenges. Right. And then uh, my buddy Dylan, I was like, hey, man, like he he was the first person I met that was sort of a self-contained studio where he wrote songs and produced his own stuff. Right. And so we were sort of kindred spirits in that way. And I was like, hey, man, like I challenge you to write a song in a month and I'll write a song in a month. And then we'll play them at the end of the month. And then we did that, and that was fun. And then I was like, hey, man, another challenge. I'll write a song instrumentally in two weeks. You'll do the same, and then we'll email each other's files, and then we'll have to write lyrics over top of each other's right, songs. Right, and so very that, different genres. Because yeah. you, like, you guys like couldn't be – maybe no, couldn't be that no, far we're apart. Not, we're not, we're like, it's not like uh, super, super night and day, but like he's like sort of a pop yeah. rap vibe and obviously hard rock and metal for me. So we, we wrote these songs, and I was like, that was a really fun creative experience that really pushed me. And then um, during COVID, it was locked down and, you know, you can't go be with your band. You can't go jam. You can't do these things. But right. like home recording has never been more accessible. And like you would know from starting like podcasting well, during the pandemic. Dude, like I went to try out. and buy a, an audio interface and you couldn't find them no, anywhere. They were, like they was. were backstocked like months. Like I ordered one from Long McQuaid online yeah. and it took like, I think uh, two months to get to me. Yeah. And by that time, like I wasn't doing much of any more of what I w yeah, was wanting it for, right? Yeah. So anyway, it's just super unique when it came to, to COVID. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, but like a lot of musicians at least have their own recording software to sort of like get their ideas down at home. So I uh, I was like, what if, what if I just put it out there? And I was like, hey, on this Saturday, starting at 11 in the morning or starting at 10 in the morning uh, until 7 p.m., I'm going to write a song. And then I'm going to live stream it after and I'll play it for people. If you want to join me, feel free. Here's the rough rules. There's no limitation on genre. And like, I want this to be open to everybody. So like, even if you just have a voice note recorder and your acoustic guitar and you just sing, you can send me that file. That's fine. Like whatever. And then like, it right. had like 35 applications, which like isn't a lot, but like that is 35 songs. Like well, that. and 35 songs that are written plus a lot of these people weren't people you knew personally. No, yeah, like it spread out and like a lot. Of, I knew I recognized about half the names doing it. And I was like, okay, like maybe there's something here. And then lockdowns continued, so I ended up doing about seven or eight of them. Uh, I got some plugin companies to give away plugins as so like cool. a thing, and Long McQuaid gave away some free rentals for people who didn't have the equipment. Okay. And honestly, the the coolest thing for me was like seeing. I still get tagged. Be like, hey, this song was originally written as this. And then we revisited it. Like my one, my friend Dylan, I think like three or four songs that were on challenges ended up on his latest record. Um, and it, it was just cool that like this negative time, yeah, I was able to, this idea was bigger than me. I don't really think it was like, I feel like I just was sort of this conduit that facilitated this. And then other people sort of tapped into it. Cause obviously you had to put in the work yourself and there was no one policing you. So it was like, just, just try this. And like, through the challenge, I think like several hundred songs were written. So cool. And like 700 like, songs that honestly wouldn't have been written if this didn't happen. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so like that to me, like, I guess you asked me earlier, the biggest achievement, I gave you the songs, but I feel like being a part of this and helping facilitate this and helping like turn a really negative, depressing time into yeah, something sort, such of, a hard sort time, of happy yeah. for a lot of musicians. Like I'm really, well, getting really them just creating that. again. Cause I think 
you know, when we're struggling even mentally or struggling with depression or whatever, some you of these mental health things. But creating is some of the, one of the some of the best medicine oh, I think we can sure. take is just you know, even like going outside for a walk, but like just creating space to create where yeah. it's like you're just having fun again. Because mm-hmm. I think that was the thing that was taken away. A lot of fun. Like we weren't totally. having fun anymore. And the 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 listening parties were like a blast. It so took me a fun. while to sort of figure out how to do it. But like eventually I just would be like live streaming and I'd play the music and everyone would be in chat. Like not on like like a, a YouTube live stream or something. It was just like just a Facebook, webcam yeah. and music and whatever. But like people would be like, yo, this is sick. And then people actually, the goal was to like, one of my goals was to sort of create a virtual open mic jam cohesion where people meet and exchange ideas and stuff. And that's what happened here. Um, that these people were like, I love your voice. Like, let's write. So a lot of these people connected and wrote songs together that are on albums and, and whatever. And like, it was, it was a sense of community that the music community specifically had been lacking for a long time. And a lot of industries were hurt by, Every, by, everything. by COVID. So it's not like this is unique, but there was something about like, you couldn't go out and, perform because yep. it's part of who you are you lose your identity in that you can't write songs with other people you can't perform your songs like that a lot of that lot was lost and a lot of people's identities were lost in that so right. th- there was sort of a because sometimes i think there. the writing process is to be able to perform them you know to actually yeah, have this the sure. platform to so perform. the live stream perform like the live yeah. stream thing at the so end cool. meant to a lot of people and i am planning on doing one more in the new year and i want to make it uh, like in person, obviously, because there's no restrictions anymore. But I want to have like a bunch of studios sign up and a bunch of bands sign up, and then roulette. You just get paired with a producer, mm. and I, I have a lot of studios who are interested. Obviously, th- this is like logistically harder to build, so I've been working on it. And also, people, you should release a. You're gonna release a CD. I, I thought that was part of the thing, with, like well, the best of. I was gonna or, do like, a band camp, but like at first I wanted to do that, but then I realized it was sort of. The only th- the only person you were against in this challenge was yourself. It's like, can I can I make in the clock? Maybe can I can I do this? I didn't want to rate people or say this song is better than others because right. like, there's some people who are like borderline professional musicians who put out amazing work for eight hours, and then there's some other people who like they had never written a song in their lives. Right, this is so just like a start you can't hold that. those people no. to the same standards. So, I um, think you should still do a CD and not best of just like <laughs> every song. It's like it's written. like pop goes. Uh, pop goes punk like yeah. those you know yeah, I guess it's like so. eight hour song Ryan John's one two three like all the, ver- the things you should do it for sure vinyls for sure too there's a lot of songs that end up being half finished or rewritten so I mean like I, it definitely could be yeah. could be something yeah and then you got nominated for an award I did so some people who did the challenge it meant a lot to them they all emailed the YYC Music Awards which is basically like the Grammys but for Calgary and uh, I just woke up one day and my phone was like going crazy with people texting me and it was like, congrats. And I was like, I don't like, I didn't get married and our kid was <laughs> yeah. born a while ago. Like yeah. what's happening. And uh, it was, it was because I got nominated for industry person of the year. So cool. And that was a really cool category because every nominee had done something unique and cool for the Calgary music community. Like one guy, they like changed the Delta hotel in Calgary they covered the swimming pool in the in the center deck. It was sort of like a a, a courtyard where all the rooms face yeah. inwards. Justin Bieber did a concert like that a few years ago. Yeah, I think it, it was actually during COVID he did uh, one. It might have been something like this. So they they did something called concerts live, and a bunch of other the nominee nominees were all doing like really cool things to connect people during COVID. And like that was just like it was a really cool category to be considered so cool. for, and. Um, just i don't know it was it was, it was humbling to oh, cool. be a part of it it was cool awesome well i think we're gonna end but i appreciate it thank you so much for joining the podcast today thanks for having um, me yeah no it's an honor to have you thanks uh, mom for letting us use your, yeah. your beautiful kitchen yeah exactly hilarious story before we got on um i wanted to get rid of this bread maker right here but i so i unplugged it but it's on a timer so i panicked had to call my mom like i don't know what to do yeah, <laughs> the bread maker unplugged but plugged pizza it back dough. in and it worked perfect so the only way we make pizza is calling dominoes that's pretty much it but anyway thank you so much god and thank you um, for joining us today i'll see you later thank you for joining us today for the known podcast we have new content coming out every wednesday so make sure to come back next week for a new episode if you haven't yet make sure to follow us on instagram at known podcast and follow us on your favorite podcast platform see you next week